Executive Director for the Shiro's Project. I'm so excited to welcome you all to the fifth episode of season two. Um, today, I'll be speaking with Kathleen Walsh, who is a current product and program manager at Verizon and soon to be chief of staff for the network integration team in the Global Network and Technology Organization. So congratulations, Kathleen, on the new role and welcome to the Shiro's Project. I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Shiro's Project seems such an awesome effort you're doing for women in STEM. So I'm excited just to be part of it. Thank you. Okay, so if you're ready, I'd love to just dive right in. Um, so can you start out by telling us a little bit about your personal and professional journey to where you are today? I will, and I'm going to show you before I get started a little filter that I created. I'm going to put this on. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> and you can see this is, I thought it'd be a fun thing to do for innovation topic. Mm -hmm. I'll create a little snap filter for you. Yeah, and totally. with your logo, and I actually had to hack this together because to get the cape running, um, I don't know if you knew Snap, you use Snapchat or not, mm -hmm. but a lot of times in the background, it's just a tiled image that's falling, and that's yeah. the only thing you can do. So I had to animate this myself in Blender using some 3D modeling, bring it in and trick it into thinking it was an image. So a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, but anyway, to get to the topic at hand, I am Kathleen Walsh, and I'm currently a program manager, product owner for an artificial intelligence capability in marketing, as, as you know, and you've just mentioned. Before joining Verizon, I worked for the U.S. Army's Strategic Transformation Office, where I applied gamification to our strategy. And with the Army, I had started out as a software developer and moved up through systems engineering and enterprise architecture. And in schooling, I was very technical with my background with computer science, systems engineering, enterprise architecture. And my personal brand is that I'm a game changer, disruptor, strategist, playmaker, and visionary. And I've leveraged years of experience in the technical as well as my business savvy to really drive strategic transformation and come up with creative solutions. And before getting into my journey, there are two stories I really want to tell about myself. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to turn off the filter so that it's not too annoying for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's two stories I like to actually tell about myself. And one of them was when I was a little um, baby, I was in a walker. And I can remember being in the kitchen in my house and wanting to get into the room that had all the toys. And it was, there was a baby gate that was up and the room with the toys had a brick floor and that's the, re and the step that went down. And that's the reason why the gate was there. And I remember wanting to just get through it. And so for whatever reason, I like backed up in this walker and started like moving my legs and crashed right through the gate with some momentum and went soaring through the room and flying across the floor. And I remember my mom's like blood curdling scream and her coming in and the punishment I got afterwards. But I can remember in that moment being so pleased with myself. And it's really something I like to tell people because I've always had that same attitude as I did as a little baby, where I was never afraid of just jumping right in, being fearless and trying new things. My motto is just to see what happens and adjust. And the second story that I like to tell is that when I was 18, I was a lifeguard at a day camp and I was teaching kids how to, do, to swim. And when you were trained to, to be an instructor, there was a certain process you had to follow. And you had to teach kids how to swim freestyle and then backstroke and then breaststroke and then butterfly swim and then they could go on to advanced stuff. And there was one student who had cerebral palsy and he wasn't able to lift his arms. So I saw that he wasn't able to swim. And he had been going for lessons for three years and nobody had made any progress with him. And so what I did was I was looking at how he moved his body and I saw that he could sort of move his arms a little bit. And so I skipped over freestyle and the backstroke and instead adapted a weird kind of mix of some of the other strokes into something we called the frog swim. And he was able to hold his breath amazingly long, and he was able to swim actually across the entire pool. 
And one week I went on vacation, but I had left detailed notes for the person taking over for me on how to actually help this child. And I came back and I was chewed out by the head lifeguard because she told me that this child didn't know how to swim. And I was like, what are you talking about? Because this whole summer I've been watching him swim across the pool. And she was like, well, I asked him to do the freestyle and, and he wasn't able to. And that was really, you know, my first exposure to, to meeting somebody that was just so focused on the process of what they were given and wasn't able to look at the problem they were trying to solve, which was to help the student learn how to swim. Instead, they had their blinders on and were just so into having to have all the boxes checked that they weren't open to actually seeing things that weren't there. And I tell these two stories because I think it's important for people to know this about me. I don't like to follow processes blindly and I'm not afraid to try things. Um, and now if you I want to get a little bit into my actual journey, I didn't actually want to be somebody that majored in computer science. And I won't get too much into that because I guess you'll have to read the book, but uh, I grew up in an environment that really did not foster creativity and put down a lot of the ideas that I had because it was really outside thinking that I've always kind of grown up with. And both my parents were actually uh, people that were computer scientists and had their masters in computer science. And because of the way they, they treated me and my ideas, I didn't want to have anything to do with what they were working on. And I associated, unfortunately, that with computers and everything with that. Uh, but I was a great student and I took a lot of AP classes and in English to physics. And I took two years of advanced physics and I actually thought that's what I was going to major in. Uh, I was also really into a lot of sports and I had made varsity field hockey my sophomore year of high school. And it was actually through that that I got into computer science. One day I had seen the computer science uh, professor or teacher in high school because he was the JV coach. He was really struggling with how to, to dribble in field hockey. And so I ran over to him and I introduced myself and I asked him if he needed some help. And as we were talking, he was telling me that he was that computer science teacher in advanced web development. And he was trying to convince me to, to join the class, but I really didn't want to have anything to do with it. But somehow, he convinced me to take web development. And I absolutely loved it. And <laughs> to me, it was something that allowed me to really express my creativity. Uh, and I was able to, to start building websites for the sports teams. And I became the student webmaster. And this was at a time before social media or before the time when all these high schools had out of the box websites. And I was just having a blast. And he then convinced me because I was good at JavaScript and all the computer scientists out there, please hold your hats. But he told me that because I was good at JavaScript, I should be good at Java. And we all know those aren't the same things, but I didn't know any better and I believed him. And so I took AP computer science. And long story short, I went off to major in computer science in college. I had a lot of experiences, which I'm sure could be a talk for another day about how I used all these skills over and over again from web development into software engineering, getting an internship with the Department of Defense that really changed my whole perspective on what computer science meant because I was solving problems to help the war fighters, which really resonated with me and was a great human cause, to finally working my way up through the Army from being that software developer to then being a systems engineer and uh, going on to enterprise architecture efforts, which I'll save for maybe some of the other questions that you're gonna ask me. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. I loved hearing those stories at the beginning and I just love everything that you're about. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, so now that I know a little bit about how you got into technology in general, I would love to hear how you became interested and passionate about virtual reality specifically and what keeps you motivated and what keeps you interested in it? Yeah, so when I was with the Army, I, I fell into systems engineering a little bit by accident, just like I did through field hockey into computer science. 
um, but I was one of the first courses I took in my master's degree for systems engineering was an architecture course. And there's actually a book, and I have it here. This is the one book that I've kept from my master's degree. It's called The Engineering Design of Systems. And there was this book, and there was this picture inside it, and it looked kind of like this, a big architecture diagram. And when I first saw that, there was like this light bulb that went off in my head about how we could actually apply a lot of these architecture concepts to the business layer of the organization. And the reason this became important to me was because I had been a project lead. I grew up very quickly into becoming somebody that was not just a small team lead, but I was leading very large scale enterprise wide systems. And I was constantly frustrated because there weren't clear requirements uh, coming down to me as that lead developer to actually be able to implement this stuff. And I tell that story because that happened back in 2010 when I saw that image. And it was actually for, for eight years that I was working on over and over again, trying to sell people on some of my ideas that I was having because I was creating completely new artifacts that didn't exist out in the world on how I thought I could actually help organizations do their strategic planning, resource allocation, mergers and acquisitions, and all that kind of stuff. And so one of the ideas that I had around 2015 was that I wanted to start creating uh, a space where I could actually have all these different capabilities that existed in the organization and have some kind of like room, for example, imagine like a wall to wall room of these capabilities and processes that I could like drag around and actually manipulate and do some kind of like real time rendering to let me know what kind of effect it would have if I changed something that was right in front of me. And at that time, people kind of looked at me blankly when I would say things like that, except one of my good friends and her name was Radhika Patel. And we went into my office and we were kind of throwing around these ideas and we were throwing a ball and I started to think about well, what can we do to get people to try the ideas that we have. And we landed on games. And because we worked for the army, we thought it would be a cool idea to develop a war game. And so I developed a war game alongside Radhika. Got to bring in a lot of my skill sets about game design and storytelling. Uh, but that's the time when after that I finished that war game, I really wanted to do more with immersive experiences. Because to me, there's nothing more powerful than actually living through something. And so during the past year and a half with this pandemic that's been going on, I started to get more into coding again, studying Unity, the gaming engine, not because I was necessarily interested in building games, but because I was interested in using it for filmmaking and some of my other storytelling capabilities. And so I signed up for a workshop in the beginning of 2021 through a company called XR Terra, which was a design in virtual reality and augmented reality. And that was actually really eye opening to me because I was working hand in hand with a lot of designers and I was able to start thinking about all these ideas that I had back in 2010, 2014, 2015, how I could actually finally bring them to life. And so what I was talking about before was being able to walk into a room and being able to actually touch and feel things. I couldn't do that before, but now with virtual reality, I could actually build that. And the other thing we have that we didn't have before is 5G which is going to allow that real time rendering that I was actually speaking to. And so we're just kind of at this like perfect point of storytelling and technology that's going to actually allow people to be in something like VR where it's writing directly on your brain and it's allowing you to actually experience and feel things that are right in front of you. And to me, there's no more powerful medium than being able to do something like that. And so I may or may not be saying that a business architecture virtual reality experience is coming, but I'll leave that up to you to interpret. Yeah, well, I think that VR is probably one of the coolest technologies to have come out of the past few years. So I am also really excited to see what's in store for that. 
Um, but I would love to hear a little bit more about some of your projects that you've been doing with virtual reality and also how your work at Verizon has allowed you to foster that passion and how you've been able to incorporate all these different fields that you're professionally, um, I don't know, that you've studied and that you're really good at from what I'm hearing. Um, so I would just like to hear a little bit about how you mix all of these different passions and interests um, into these side projects and also into the work that you're doing at Verizon. Yeah, so I'm um, actually, I'm not currently doing anything with virtual reality at Verizon. Um, all of this has really been on my own. However, I will say that business architecture and filmmaking and all these other interests and passions I have started out the same way where I was doing them on the side, but then I started to find a way to actually bring them in to work and be able to do that as part of my day job as well. Uh, so even though I'm not doing it yet, I'm sure that's coming. <laughs> and I'm currently, as you, you knew in the beginning, was uh, I'm a program manager for this AI effort called one-to-one -one personalization. And it's really about understanding like our customers on a personal level and being able to deliver things to them that really resonate. And throughout my journey at Verizon, I've become really interested in data privacy. And I really believe that, you know, Verizon, we're a privacy first company. We do everything we can to protect the customer. And that is super important to me. And what I started to notice was as I was speaking to people, not really in Verizon, because we know what's going on over there, but just like the general public, they didn't really understand what some of these repercussions are for sharing or not sharing their data and what companies were for them and what companies maybe weren't so for them. And I was speaking at a data science uh, class with uh, at Ramapo College because they just started to do a master's in data science. And I was talking to them about data privacy. And what I started to think about was I had created these war games on organizational problems, which were really a great exponential kind of learning to really immerse people in. And I started thinking, well, why don't I create a game uh, that can actually help data science students to actually see what the repercussions are for the effects that they're, they're, they're building in all these algorithms. And so I was, that's been one of the reasons I started to study virtual reality, because that was something that I thought, well, if I can use augmented or virtual reality with these students, maybe that would help them actually to experience it. And something I would love to do with Verizon is to take some of these ideas I have and maybe be able to build them. You know, we have a lot of different technology in Verizon and we all are really working hard to make sure that our 5G network is out and spread out to everybody and people are gonna be able to use it because that's the technology that's gonna empower us to use things like VR. So if there was a way where I could actually start to implement some of these ideas that I have, we would actually not only be able to have the network, but we'd have actual immersive experiences that could showcase how, because of our network, we're able to help each other and other human beings. And one of the things I, I'd like to talk about was when I was creating, when I was going through this boot camp, I uh, was trying to think of how to use some of my, my cards that I've built in the past. And I have, I mentioned game changer, disruptor, playmaker, and strategist business cards. And these are, this is like one of them. And what I wanted to do was really bridge the gap between having like my resume and between a resume and an interview, have something where people could really like learn more about me and kind of bring myself to life before they even meet me. And so what I did was I took these cards and I created an interactive resume and I used photogrammetry, which is where you actually take like a million pictures scanning something like my face. And I was able to take those pictures and turn it into a 3D model. I animated it, I fixed some of the errors, and I actually coded this whole app and I was able to actually uh, bring myself to life. And what I did as well was I used some of my filmmaking skills to actually create a little movie trailer to get people excited about it. And if you don't mind, I would actually love to, to show it here. Um, 
just to show you kind of what you can do with augmented reality. Yeah, that would be amazing. really bit the big one. Sure did. And 2021's not serving up to be much better. <sighs> no, it's not. What should we do? What if we created our own reality? Yeah, cool idea. Game Changer. Game Changers find new ways of doing things that are all about transforming the future. From creating presentations using Lego bricks, to stop motion, to short films, to wargaming, I let my imagination run wild. What is a playmaker? Well, I'm a big picture thinker, and let me tell you, the view is fine from up here. I live for disruption. I like to break things and see how seemingly unrelated things can be pulled together. I believe ideas trigger more ideas, and I'm motivated to help explain, teach, and interpret. Better to get in and get wet rather than wait and observe. We can learn a lot from the ocean, see patterns, be prepared, catch the wave and ride. Big picture thinker. And that's that. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you asked how all this stuff comes into play at Verizon or even with the Army. And ever since I started doing these different films, I bring them in kind of wherever I can. And when I did a war game, that was the first little trailer that I ever did, which people again can see on my website, my YouTube page or wherever. And it's like 45 seconds long, but, and at that time I had just used iMovie because while I was actually facilitating this war game, I was filming people and, but it was so cool and it brought the story to life. And when I was speaking at different conferences on my war game idea and what I had done, I showed that film. And not only did people across the army really resonate with it, people at the conferences would be like applauding and like really engaged. And that's when I realized like, maybe I'm a great speaker and maybe people would like to listen to me, but films really are the thing that can translate really what I'm saying to other people. And so now even at work, during the beginning of the pandemic, I taught myself animation and had taken my own Bitmoji and my IT programmer, uh, program leads Bitmoji, put that together to create like a fun little story. And it has nothing to do with work, but it was this great team building moment. And so that's the kind of stuff that, that I like to do and, and really resonates when you're trying to do a lot of innovation because there's a lot of change management that gets involved. And without relationships and support, you're not gonna get anywhere. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that no matter how amazing a speaker is having something a tool like this that's infinitely more engaging and interactive um, it can hook people much faster and personally i know that i am much more responsive to a tool like that um, again like i said no matter how incredible a speaker is i would always prefer some, like a video or some kind of engaging interactive um, presentation to just a exactly. speaker. But I, yeah, I can't get over how cool that video was.
Okay. Is it up on YouTube publicly? It's well, right now it's unlisted. I I guess I should I should list it um, because I released it on LinkedIn, and so I was waiting to to release it there. But mm -hmm. Got it. I'll do that after this. <laughs> if anyone wants to go see it, it'll be there. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so we are just about running out of time, but I have one final question for you. And so you're someone who obviously you don't let your job or your professional um, aspirations get in the way of your personal interests. And I was just wondering if you could share some advice, maybe one big piece of advice or a learning that you've come across during your journey for young women or young people who are just breaking into their to the professional world and who kind of need that little piece of inspiration to help them understand that they don't need to let what they do professionally stop them from also realizing their personal or other types of interests and aspirations. Yeah, I love that question. And I, I think it's just so important because you're right, I am somebody that, like I really know myself mm -hmm. and I know what I bring to the table, what my brand is. And I'm always open to what other people have to say, but I'm also somebody that knows what I'm doing and will really be tenacious. But there was actually, when I first started my career with the army, I can remember one of my first bosses saying that your career is your career and what you make it. And that there's no boss and there's nobody that can tell you what you should and shouldn't be doing. And if somebody tries to, then you're really probably in an environment that's not going to foster right, that creativity and allowing you to really be your authentic self. And you probably need to try to move on. But sometimes you can't move on and you're kind of stuck in, in your career or where you are until you, you can make a change. And so one of the things that I've done, and you've learned that right through these, these few short minutes that we've talked to each other, is I'm always learning and I'm always looking for other things that are out there. I mean, during this past year and a half in this pandemic, I've been on countless Zoom calls with webinars and conferences because even though the world shut down in a different way, it opened up because all of a sudden, all these events that you could only go to when you were there locally were now open to the whole world. And so what I really want to do is maybe leave you with a statement. It's learn as much as you can about everything and diversify yourself. Make sure the teams that you're working on are filled with people from all different backgrounds. And I'm fortunate that I do find everything interesting and I research almost everything I do. And that's why I have so many different knowledge bases, which helps me with innovation. But you have to remember that transparency is really important. And I'm not just talking about transparency with like data privacy and all that kind of thing. I'm talking about transparency as a human. And that's the only way that we can really gain trust and become better with each other. And that's part of the reason that I did share with you with some of my personal story and experiences as from my childhood, which is not necessarily something that I usually open up about. But again, I wanted to be my authentic self. An algorithm doesn't know really how to call me out when I'm doing something wrong. And I'll leave you with something that if not innovative, it's definitely provocative, but there's no amount of technology that can be a substitute for humanity. And so we as women, we as humans all have to be looking out for each other. Thank you so much. Um, that's so important. I agree. And I feel so fortunate to have been able to speak to you and be inspired by you today. Um, I'm so excited for everybody who is about to listen to this to also be able to go through that same learning experience that I just did. So thank you so much, Kathleen, for joining me today. Um, and for speaking with me and answering all these questions and of course sharing that video. Um, I think this has been a great conversation and yeah, thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you so much for having me and I'll yes. be following you and seeing where you're going with your own career.